Good afternoon. The first item of business today is portfolio questions. Question number one, Linda Fabiani. <laughs> to ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the importance of deer control in urban settings. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. Deer management and control in urban and lowland settings is just as important as that carried out in upland Scotland or any other land type. The likelihood of increased public presence in the urban areas will always be a key consideration in ensuring that deer management is delivered safely and with appropriate consideration for deer welfare. Linda Fabiani. Does the Cabinet Secretary recognise the importance of local operatives, such as those members of the South Lanarkshire Deer Group, in controlling the unique peri-urban deer situation? And does she also recognise the potential of the work already started to identify local facilities to chill, to store and to prepare venison for local consumption? Uh, does the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that this would be good for the environment and good for health? Secretary. The Scottish Government of course supports sustainable uh, deer management that protects the public interest and we welcome the contribution uh, of the South Lanarkshire Deer Management Group and others in the Lowland Deer Network Scotland who have an interest in deer management and deer welfare in Lowland Scotland. I mean, obviously Lowland Deer do provide a range of benefits. Uh, that includes supporting biodiversity, it does include venison as a healthy food source uh, and it provides an experience of nature for many urban dwellers. However, deer do have impacts on crops and trees and do need to be managed to reduce risks of deer vehicle collision. So there, there is an issue of management uh, around that. Uh, but the Scottish Government is very keen, and I'm sure my colleague to my left here would want to endorse this, very keen to support the development of more local food supply chains. I understand that grant assistance can be made for both the capital costs and cooperative market, marketing activities to assist with projects such as the development of a community deer larder in the central belt in Scotland to enable venison to be used locally. Peter Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, developing a robust count programme is crit crucial to understanding the extent of deer numbers in urban settings. Following research in 2009, Scottish, Scottish Natural Heritage pledged to use thermal imaging technology to monitor deer populations. How accurate are current estimates of urban deer populations? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, will, uh, I will ensure that uh, SNH uh, give a detailed response to the member in respect of that question. Obviously, uh, counting deer numbers is a constant issue, uh, whether you're in urban uh, lowland or indeed uh, 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 rural Scotland. Uh, deer numbers are uh, a concern for everybody. Assessing the numbers is important, but keeping that assessment up to date is also important. And I will get SNH to deliver uh, to, to write to the member with the very specific technical issues that he's raising. Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, has the issue of urban deer been considered in the Scottish Natural Heritage Review of Deer Management 2016? And has the review recommendation of advice and training in urban deer management for local authorities? Uh, being considered Cabinet Secretary. Well, SNH is currently finalising its report uh, on the review of deer management to be uh, submitted to me uh, by 31st October, so it is, uh, it is imminent. It uh, uh, will cover uh, a range of issues. Um, uh, it's of the current arrangements for the sustainable management of deer in Scotland. It will no doubt raise issues that have just been raised on the other side of the chamber. Um, and, uh, and whether or not the current voluntary system is, is working. Um, it will include uh, all deer, so I think we can uh, assume that uh, the issues that uh, Claudia Bimish is concerned about will be part of that. Um, uh, it's going to provide an update on the work of the Lowland Deer Network, um, and there will be specific uh, uh, coverage of that. Um, so I hope that's enough for Claudia Bimish to look forward to the report with some interest. Question number two has been withdrawn. Question number three, Alex Cole Hamilton. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what action it will take to protect Greenbelt land from developers in order to achieve outcome three of the 2020 challenge for Scotland's biodiversity. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish planning policy sets out a range of policies to conserve and enhance nature, green space, and landscapes. Planning authorities can identify green belts or review boundaries within local development plans. These plans should also identify the most sustainable locations for longer-term development. 
Pascal Hamilton. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response. The failure of Scottish Government to seek the removal of the Camo estate from Edinburgh's local development plan in its recent report will lead to the loss of natural heritage and biodiversity in my constituency of Edinburgh Western. In recent years, we have experienced a proliferation of house building uh, in the west of the city, the eradication of Greenbelt, and they're also putting unsustainable pressure on arterial routes. In 2015, St John's Road and Queensferry Road were named as two of the most polluted roads in Scotland, given air pollution causes two and a half thousand early deaths every year. Will the Cabinet Secretary work with ministerial colleagues to do, do more to protect our green belt in new legislation, and in particular, call in any future applications associated with the Camo estate? Um, well, um, uh, Alex Colhamerton should be aware that I will not be calling in applications. This is a matter for my colleague Kevin Stewart. I have frequent conversations with Kevin Stewart, as I do uh, with all of my colleagues. Scottish planning policy does support the redevelopment of brownfield land before new development takes place on greenfield sites. Uh, and uh, uh, that will continue to be the case. They are a planning designation. Green belts are a planning designation used to direct development to appropriate locations, protect and enhance the character, landscape, setting and identity of a settlement and protect and provide access to open space. Uh, and in all these, uh, I think it's fair to say that decisions are taken on the merits of individual cases. Maurice Golden. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. B uh, biodiversity is critically important in both an urban and a rural environment, and I would like to ask the Cabinet Secretary how many biodiversity sub surveys have been conducted by SNH and related NGOs in the last five years, and what plans are in place to develop a baseline for biodiversity in Scotland? SNH gives the member the detailed information that he requires. Question number five, Gordon MacDonald. Justice Scottish Pickford, Government. Pickford, what pro I Sorry? I thought you were. Yeah. <laughs> Question number four, Ivan McKee. Uh, thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what the annual cost is to local authorities of sending disposable nappies to landfill. Cabinet Secretary Rosanna Cunningham. Zero Waste Scotland estimates that around 55,000 tonnes of absorbable hydrogen hygiene products, which includes disposable nappies, were sent to landfill or energy recovery facilities in 2014. Disposal fees for that amount of material are estimated to cost local authorities around £5.5 million per year. Evan McKee. Uh, thank you. Um, the Cabinet Secretary will surely agree that the, the financial and environmental cost arising from the widespread use of disposable nappies to local councils and ultimately to us all can be ill-afforded. What steps is the Scottish Government taking to alleviate this situation? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I, I would remind the member that the £5.5 million per year, um, while it includes disposable nappies, is not solely the result uh, of disposable nappies. Um, I, however, I, however, do agree with him that we would all rather see our communities save money and our councils invest in improving services rather than spending money to dispose uh, of material in landfill. Um, Zero Waste Scotland has promoted the use of real nappies through its volunteer network. And for those who choose to use real nappies instead of disposable nappies, local real nappy networks and the Real Nappy Information Service also offer parents advice and support. This time, question number five, Gordon McDonald. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what progress it's making towards compiling an open, transparent and comprehensive land register. The land register held by the Registers of Scotland has been operational since 1981. In May 2014, the Government invited the Keeper of the Registers of Scotland to complete the land register by 2024, with all public land being registered by 2019. Work is well underway to meet these targets. On 11th September, uh, we launched our consultation on proposals for a register of controlling interests in landowners and tenants. Uh, that arises out of the land reform legislation passed by this parliament earlier this year. The regulations we take forward following the public consultation will help communities and the wider public to know and understand more about the people who control landowners and tenants in Scotland. Colonel MacDonald. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The Scottish Vacant and Derrick Land Survey of 2015 highlighted there was 12,674 hectares not in productive use across Scotland that could provide the space for over half a million homes. 
What is the Scottish Government intending to do to encourage development in those areas in order to protect arable land from future housing developments? Cabinet Secretary. Um, this, this, of course, links back to the earlier question on green belts. The Scottish planning policy does place a strong emphasis on achieving uh, the right development in the right place and sets out guiding principles for development plans to promote a sustainable pattern of development appropriate to their area. Particular decisions to identify housing developments on vacant and derelict land would be a matter for individual planning authorities in their development plans. The vacant derelict land fund can be used to cover a variety of costs associated with the remediation of vacant and derelict lands so that in future it can be brought back into productive use. And that could range from industrial, recreational, farm or forestry activities to a mixed use development, which could also include housing elements. Such decisions on the future use and development of vacant and derelict land would be dealt with through the planning system. David Stewart. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary share my view that the holy grail of land reform must be a fully open and transparent land register? To me, that means no front companies, no shady shell PLCs, and no multinational tax havens registered in Panama. The history of land reform in the Highlands and Islands is littered with examples of abuse of power and privilege. Now is the time to open a fresh page on land reform. Cabinet Secretary. I could hardly disagree with the member. Um, his uh, intentions uh, for the future of land reform would certainly be mine as well. Unfortunately, we don't have power over all of those issues. I would very much like to do so, uh, and I would invite the member to join me in calling on the Westminster Government to devolve the areas that would be required to be devolved in yeah. order to achieve the outcome yeah. we both want. Yeah. Question six has, been, has not been lodged. Question seven, Liz Smith to ask the Scottish Government what action it's taking to ensure that its land reform legislation does not have a negative impact on young people. Cabinet Secretary. Um, the Land Reform Scotland Act 2016 does introduce, introduce a number of key provisions to reform agricultural holdings legislation for the industry and to provide more positive opportunities to young people to gain access to tenant farming opportunities. These were developed in discussion with agriculture and, tenant, and tenant farming stakeholder organisations including the new entrant advisory panel appointed by us to provide advice on issues around support and assistance to new entrants. We listen to those groups to ensure fairness to all regardless of their age. Land reform legislation as a whole helps in facilitating the development of sustainable communities uh, which uh, are, have at, its at their heart the need to provide local employment which will keep population in the area, including young people. Yes, Thank you for that reply. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary will, I'm sure, be aware of the recent debate in the Scottish Farmer magazine, which expressed the fear that the absolute right to buy entitlement is likely to create a barrier uh, for new tenancies for young people. The point being that the landowners will not create new tenancies while the threat of being forced to sell their land hangs over them. Will the Scottish Government therefore give clarity to the farming industry and reassurances to young tenant farmers by gu guaranteeing no absolute right to buy when secondary legislation on the Land Reform Act comes forward. Cabinet the Secretary. Cabinet Secretary for the Rural Economy is muttering at me that this is actually a question that uh, is for him. Um, I am aware of the debate that has been taking place and I'm conscious that there is uh, um, a, a discussion going on about the future uh, of tenant farming. There is funding available to new entrants. Uh, I, I know that there is start-up finance uh, also available uh, and the, we are already doing uh, uh, work to enable younger people access to land. An independent group was set up in 2015 for example to examine ways of increasing the number of starter opportunities on publicly owned land. So we are doing uh, um, what we can to, uh, to try and encourage more young people onto the land to ensure that young people uh, are providing that generational input at the, at the younger age range so that the age gap which is beginning to grow uh, will not uh, uh, will not make things uh, make things worse uh, I'm sure my colleague Fergus Ewing will however come back to the member uh, if he feels that there are more specific issues that he would wish to discuss with her question number eight Emma Harper thank you presiding officer it's to ask the Scottish government what action it takes to control the trade in puppies Cabinet Secretary. The breeding and sale of puppies is strictly regulated by the Breeding of Dogs Act 1973, as amended by the Breeding of Dogs Act 1991 and the Breeding and Sale of Dogs Welfare Act 1999. Commercial breeding and sale of puppies can only take place legally under the authority of a licence issued under this legislation by the local authority. 
stricter measures to ensure that a dealer selling more than two dogs aged under 12 weeks in any 12-month period needs to obtain an additional licence were introduced by the Licensing of Animal Dealers, Young Cats and, Do and Young Dogs, Scotland Regulations 2009. Emma Harper. Thank you for your answer. Um, as the Cabinet Secretary will be aware, the SSPCA has identified the port of Cairn Ryan near Stranraer as a crucial point at which the illegal trade of puppies can be disrupted. Many of my constituents in the South West have expressed concern to me about this on animal welfare grounds. Some have even formed an action group. Does the Cabinet Secretary agree that a public information campaign highlighting good practice amongst breeders will encourage people to be vigilant when choosing whom to purchase a pet from, which will contribute towards disrupting this illegal and cruel trade? Cabinet Secretary. Well, there's already a great deal of information available. Unfortunately, some people continue to choose to ignore it. Um, the Scottish Government Code of Practice for the Welfare of Dogs, which was approved by this Parliament in 2010, does advise potential purchasers on the aspects to consider when obtaining a puppy and how to purchase it from a reputable source. The Code of Practice also provides details of animal welfare organisations that provide advice on the purchase of a puppy. Um, and the Scottish Government has currently is currently commissioning research to consider how the demand for illegally traded puppies in Scotland can be addressed. Colin Smith. Thank you, President Officer. The Minister will be aware of the, the outstanding work that's taking place in Cairn Ryan involving the Scottish SPCA, the Council's Trade and Standards Team, the police, the ferry firms, and indeed the local community to crack down on the illegal dog trade industry. But will the Cabinet Secretary ensure that this work is properly resourced mm -hmm. by the Scottish Government and ensure that the current legislation is tightened up to support that work? The Scottish Government uh, does support action being taken by local authorities and the Scottish so Society for the Prevention of Cruel uh, Cruelty to Animals regarding illegal sales and illegal imports of puppies. Um, we also support the work of the Pet Ad uh, Advertising Advisory Group uh, in highlighting the internet advertising of illegally trade pu uh, traded puppies. Um, so we're uh, uh, already in, uh, in the business of uh, supporting uh, uh, this work. Uh, I am aware of the, group in, the local group in Cairn Ryan that the uh, member has uh, uh, raised. I know that a number of members in the chamber have uh, been in conversations uh, with this particular group. Um, and uh, uh, I think th that they have had some considerable number of conversations with officials just about what, uh, uh, what some of the issues are around the uh, illegal trading. Um, and uh, uh, I look forward to there being some continued uh, uh, communication between my officials and them uh, in respect of the work they're doing. Um, and uh, as I indicated before, the Scottish Government is putting in support to local authorities uh, to make sure that they are able to do what they need to be able to do in respect of the illegal import of puppies. Morris Golden. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I would like to ask when the, the research the Cabinet uh, Secretary referred to will be published, the time skills associated with that, and also whether you could detail the support being provided to local uh, authorities with respect um, to the illegal transport of puppies. Cabinet Secretary. Well, um, indicated that the, support, uh, the research is in the process of being commissioned, so um, information about the timetabling of that, I'm afraid, is not yet available until we proceed, the commissioning, proceed with the commissioning. We, we won't have uh, an answer uh, to that. Um, uh, he's, he's asking details of the support that we are uh, putting in place. We are, uh, as I indicated, supporting uh, local authorities and the SSPCA regarding these illegal sales and illegal imports of puppies. Um, uh, we're doing uh, uh, what we can in respect of penalties as well and ensuring uh, that uh, information is available to all of those who are thinking about buying a, a dog. Uh, but uh, a, a considerable amount of the work that's involved in this is the responsibility of local authorities um, and uh, they are, of course, operating under a bigger uh, um, financial deal than simply the specifics of this. Question number nine, Alexander Burnett. Uh, presiding officer, to ask the Scottish Government whether its climate change plan will contain sectoral targets for areas such as waste, buildings, heat and transport. Cabinet Secretary. The Climate Change Plan, the third report on policies and proposals will set out how we will meet Scotland's next batch of statutory climate change targets out to 2032. We're already working to identify the best way to deliver these targets, including the contribution from individual sectors. 
In developing the climate change plan, we need to consider all options for reducing carbon across the economy, as well as the interaction between the sectors. To support development of the plan, the Scottish Government commissioned an energy modelling system, shorthand TIMES, uh, which provides insight into future technologies and energy sources. This modelling allows us to develop scenarios for delivering the targets in least cost ways by assessing how effort is best shared across sectors. Alexander Burnett. 59% uh, of Scotland's properties are rated EPCD or worse, and the Scottish Government will not meet its target to eradicate fuel poverty by November 2016. Leading economists from the University of Strathclyde and the London School of Economics this week said that if all homes reached EPCC standard, then 9,000 jobs would be created, fuel poverty cut, <coughs> emissions reduced, and ill health prevented. Does the Minister share the Scottish Conservative ambition to achieve an EPC rating on all properties by the end of the next decade at the latest? Yeah. Cabinet Secretary. Well, there are key policy issues which do need to be addressed in the climate change plan. They include investing in the national infrastructure priority to improve the energy efficiency of homes. So I hope the uh, Conservatives will be supporting uh, the proposals of this government. That will be uh, in using a warm homes bill to support accelerated deployment of renewable and district heating and reducing transport emissions uh, as well. Move on to rural economy and connectivity questions. Question number one, Miles Briggs. To ask the Scottish Government what action it has taken to improve the quality of urban broadband. Cabinet Secretary Fergus Ewing. Uh, also, whilst commercial investment is the key driver of the quality of urban broadband networks, our investment through the Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband Programme is improving coverage in a number of urban areas. At the same time, we regularly engage with telecom suppliers to encourage investment, and we are working with Ofcom to ensure that the regulatory environment stimulates that investment and ensures quality of service. Miles Briggs. Um, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. During the election campaign and in recent weeks, I've met with a number of constituents who've outlined to me the poor broadband levels which they are receiving in some parts of Edinburgh. The capital city has some of the greatest differences in broadband download speeds, with recent tests ranging from 0.47 megabits per second in Craig Lockhart to 109.6 megabits per second in Morningside. What actions is the Scottish Government taking to address these urban variations in broadband provisions, and when will the suppliers and providers of this um, be asked to address these variations? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I've uh, met with a, a number of the companies involved uh, since I was appointed as Cabinet Secretary, and plainly our ambition is for everyone to have uh, high-speed broadband connections in Scotland, uh, and we have set out a, a path to do that within uh, the period set out in a manifesto. I would say, however, that the duty to provide service in city areas rests primarily with the commercial operators. It is not an obligation that rests on the public sector. I'm sure that that's not something that the member intended to imply, although uh, many may have done just that. But I am able to reassure him that where our responsibility does rest, uh, which uh, is to uh, tackle the gaps in other parts of Scotland, we are discharging that duty. And since I have nine further questions on this, I hope to have ample opportunity to expand on that. Thank you. But more than that, Minister. Ash Denham. Could the Cabinet Secretary advise how much the Scottish Government has already invested in fibre broadband and how many premises in Scotland now have access to fibre broadband? Cabinet Secretary. Well, I may say that's an extremely helpful question, uh, Presiding Officer. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and I think, the, I think the public will wish to know the facts. And the facts are that the Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband Programme is delivering £400 million of investment with the Scottish Government and public sector partners investing around £277 million to deliver fibre broadband coverage to at least 95% of premises by the end of next year. So I see lots of faces, not all of them smiling yet, but there's time. Sally Johnson, you got John Scott. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, the, the Cabinet Secretary will be aware of lower than hope for broadband speeds in my constituency of Ayr, uh, particularly in the Wellington Square area, which is the heart of the business community in my constituency and coincidentally where my office is located, um, is there anything he can do to further encourage those who would provide us with broadband, better broadband speeds to do so forthwith? Cabinet Secretary. 
Well, it doesn't seem to have impeded the efficacy of the member's uh, output, so I'm pleased about that. Uh, but, you know, I think he raises a perfectly good point, as, all, as do all members. This plainly is one of the priorities for us all across these islands over the next few years. Uh, it is absolutely serious. It's vital that we are working together, but not letting the commercial operators off the hook uh, deliver collectively a better service. And without that, it is not possible, as Mr. Scott points out, for businesses to do their business, to be open to market. And it's a perfectly fair and reasonable point. And, uh, uh, and therefore, uh, you know, I, I, uh, I'm very keen to work with all members to achieve the objectives that we've set out. Question number two, Jenny Gilruth. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government when it last met the US Department of Agriculture regarding relaxing the import restrictions on Scottish beef and lamb. Cabinet Secretary. Um, <coughs> meetings with the US Department of Agriculture with regard to imports are carried out through the UK Export Certification Partnership and DEFRA. A number of these meetings have taken place to push for progress on opening the US market for UK beef and lamb. The US lifted their ban on EU beef in 2014. The previous Cabinet Secretary of Rural Affairs, Richard Lockhead, MSP, visited the USA and Canada last year and secured a commitment from the USDA to set a clear timeline for the approval process for the importation of Scotch beef and lamb. As a result, largely, I may say, presiding officer, due to the efforts and the persistence of my predecessor, Richard Lockhead, mm. I'm delighted that the US recently opened for consultation a proposed rule change to lift the ban on EU lamb. Jenny Gilruth. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that response. Can the Cabinet Secretary indicate the value of the lifting of these restrictions to our red meat industry? And does this mean that haggis will finally be able to be served at burn suppers in the US? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I, I can't give a precise estimate, but I can say that uh, uh, the Republic of Ireland's meat sec sector gained access last year and, and exports of approximately of three million pounds of fresh and frozen beef were made to the, to the US. What I can say is that I would be absolutely delighted if uh, haggis can once again be presented on the dining tables on the US of A. Uh, and I would be happy uh, to uh, uh, provide an address to the great chieftain of the Putin race personally <laughs> in the occasion of a burnt supper held specially on the occasion of the legalization of haggis in the USA. Peter Chapman. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, I welcome the news that in February, Scotch beef and lamb exports landed in Canada for the first time in 20 years. Can the Minister provide an update as to the success or otherwise of red meat exports to the Canadian market? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, we, we, I can certainly provide the, the member, Mr Chapman, with details of that. I will get the precise information of what, what data there is. Uh, I'm really determined, Presiding Officer, that uh, we make progress with the lifting of the, the BSE ban in Scotland. We've been BSE free for the requisite period. Uh, we are proceeding with a consultation as quickly as possible. And I'm extremely well aware of the, of the meeting with the meat wholesalers represent, representatives. Uh, that there's a, a great head of steam behind this application now and Quality Meat Scotland have done great work. Uh, I'm very hopeful that we can see the lifting of the ban and achievement of BSE negligible status, uh, and that is something that I think would be endorsed by all of us around this chamber. Question number three, Alec Johnson. To ask the Scottish Government what progress it is making in providing high-speed broadband to rural areas and town centres that are served by exchange-only lines. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government is making substantial progress on this issue. Whilst delivering fibre broadband to exchange-only lines is more time-consuming and complex, our investment through the Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband Programme has made so far extended fibre broadband available, ac uh, access available to more than 170,000 homes and businesses served by exchange-only lines, with more being connected every day in some of the hardest to reach communities across Scotland, as well as towns and cities. Al Johnson. 
Uh, permit me to declare an interest since uh, superfast broadband came to my town of Stonehaven over three years ago in a blaze of publicity. I, I have still been unable to obtain a connection since I'm on an exchange only line. Uh, co correspondence with Digital Scotland has indicated that there is no time scale in place. And given the promises that have been made by government in recent months, would it be possible to achieve a programme and a time scale which will tell individuals who suffer from this disadvantage exactly when their problems will be solved. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, I'll, I'll certainly look into the uh, position in relation to Mr Johnson's own case. Um, the Scottish Government is committed to delivering 100% superfast broadband across Scotland by 2021, and members will be interested to know that we have published the prior information notice pinned last week as the latest step in achieving uh, that ambition. Now, I'm not entirely certain that that, in fact, procedure is appropriate for the problems relating to Mr. Johnson's house because I don't know the exact whereabouts nor how it's classified. I'm happy to receive an invitation to it, and that would put that right. Uh, but, you know, I think it's fair to say that all members across this house have had many constituents. Uh, this has been raised by a great deal of businesses, and we see that this really has moved up to the top of the agenda in Scotland, both for individuals in their ordinary lives and for businesses. And that's precisely why we have devoted uh, so much public money to tackling the problems whilst acknowledging and pressing the commercial operators to do their bit. Uh, and I'm very happy, if I'm asked more questions about this, to elaborate even further. Richard Lockett. Uh, whilst tens of thousands of homes have benefited from the Scottish Government's investment into superfast broadband, uh, clearly, there is some frustration over those homes, particularly in rural areas, who still are without, whilst to see other homes getting even faster broadband speeds. Is there any pressure that can be brought to bear on BT to try and ask them and demand that they prioritise such homes as opposed to being solely numbers driven? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, we, we are in a contract with uh, BT in the Highlands and Islands uh, enterprise area, as, as Mr Lockhead well knows and we are in partnership with them, and the, the, the contract has proceeded well. In fact, under a gain share clause, where BT gained more than anticipated number of customers as set out in the contract, we've actually received more money back to reinvest in additional coverage, and that, I think, has been a, a evidence that our contract has been fairly well framed, and it's delivering more benefits than were originally intended. But, of course, Mr Lockhead is absolutely right that there are still some people who are not covered, and for them, it's very little consolation that a great deal of people are, in fact, now receiving coverage uh, and uh, have adequate broadband speeds. We are pressing BT. I met with Brendan Dick, uh, I think, last week, and with representatives of OpenReach. Uh, and I said at that meeting that I do believe that uh, OpenReach need to, and BT need to improve their performance in Scotland. However, I was pleased that there is the tone of the meeting was constructive and BT have, in a number of respects, indicated that they want and they plan to do more. Uh, and I would urge all members uh, to join with Mr. Lockhead in my, and myself uh, to make it known to BT and to OpenReach that Scotland does deserve the best possible service. And BT, with the position that they operate, are, of course, the major players in providing the commercial solutions that are required. Kenneth Gibson. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, given concerns regarding BT's monopoly position in delivering uh, super-fast broadband via exchange lines, not always efficiently, will the Scottish Government consider supporting other forms of delivery to homes and businesses, such as white space broadband? Mr. Secretary. Yeah, well, of course, we're, we're open to the various different methods of delivering the objective that we all seek. Uh, and there are a number of different, uh, different mechanisms which are, are possible. And Mr. Gibson... Uh, mentions one which may fall into that category. One of the conditions attached to the UK government's new state aid, state aid scheme for broadband is that all major new public investment in broadband is delivered via new procurements. This should allow us to drive more competition and deliver a better outcome. And we anticipate that reaching 100% superfast coverage will involve a mix of technologies and delivery models, including potentially TV white space, which is currently, I believe, uh, presiding officer, being trialled in Orkney as part of the Scottish Government's demonstrating digital programme. Rhoda Grant. Um, 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. I was interested in um, the Cabinet Secretary's previous answer, where he said that BT had actually reached more people than had been intended under the contract. Can I ask what percentage um, was in the contract? Because as I understand it, um, the, the, the promise made to Scotland was that 75% would be reached by um, superfast broadband by the end of this year. My understanding is in parts in the Highlands and Islands, that is little over 50%. I'd be interested to know what was in the contract. Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, I think it's fair to say that the progress we've made has been acknowledged by uh, Audit Scotland. I think that's the first point to say, but there's much more to be done. But uh, I will provide the precise figures in relation to gain share to the member. I know that she's got a, a serious interest in this matter, and I, I take this opportunity to apologise for being unable to meet with her earlier at lunchtime today because of other matters, which I meant to do privately, but there we are got it on the record, uh, but I will in all seriousness provide full details and I'd be happy to discuss that at the meeting, which I look forward to with great pleasure. Liam MacArthur. Thanks very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I, I noted with interest the Cabinet Secretary's response to uh, Richard Lockhead uh, earlier in relation to the white space uh, project that's been piloted in Orkney. Obviously, there's a, a wide range of te technological solutions that can help deliver the superfast broadband uh, commitment of 100% by 2021. Can he ensure or reassure my constituents that those in more outlying areas, even if they have access to it, will not be paying through the nose uh, and far more than their constituents in other parts uh, of the country will be paying? Well, I think that's a, a very fair point that Liam MacArthur raises, and it's one which does, uh, which I think is absolutely well made. And of course, we do not want uh, anyone in Orkney or in any rural or island community to pay more than in urban communities. And of course, that does happen in many, many. I see Mr. Scott nodding sagely, even as I speak. It happens in many other. Yeah, and Mr. Scott doesn't really nod in any other fashion. And, uh, so, so it's a perfectly fair point to make. The answer, I think, uh, and this is not passing the buck, it's a matter of fact, that the responsibility for the regulation of uh, telephony rests with the UK. And therefore, it is a matter for Ofcom and for the UK government supervising Ofcom. I did meet with Sharon White, the chief executive of Ofcom, recently. We had a very productive meeting as a result of which uh, a number of things were going to take forward. Uh, and I'm very grateful for that point. I will add that to the list. Question number four, Ruth Guire. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what impact withdrawal from the EU would have on the Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband Project. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the potential withdrawal of the UK from the EU will have no immediate impact on Scottish, the Scottish Government's Digital Scotland Superfast Broadband Programme. It's always a bit of a mouthful, presenting officer. The DSSB project covering the rest of Scotland benefited from funding from the 2007 to 13 ERDF programme, but has now been drawn down in full. Ruth McGuire. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer. The Cabinet Secretary will also be aware that changes to mobile roaming charges are due to be introduced in 2017. Is he concerned that Scots travelling in Europe might now miss out on this benefit should Scotland be taken out of the EU against our will? Cabinet Secretary. Well, Ofcom sets the UK telecom, Telecom's regulation in line with the principles set out in the EU's regulatory framework. So it's not yet clear how the UK government will take forward post-Brexit Telecom's regulation, nor to what extent this may diverge from the status quo. And this includes the position uh, raised by the member on the imminent abolition of mobile roaming charges, something that uh, we all welcome. Therefore, I recognise that there could be a need for the Scottish Government to engage both with Ofcom and the EU regula regulatory bodies to protect the interests of Scotland, both on roaming and more widely, to ensure that the regulatory framework continues and does more to improve rural coverage. And I'm delighted that both Mr Russell and Ms Hislop, who have the responsibility of ensuring that Scotland gets the best possible deal in the difficult situation in which we find ourselves, uh, will be taking this forward with me. Question number five, Maurice Corrie. <coughs> to ask the Scottish Government what support it provides to farmers who are in debt. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, President Officer, we are committed to providing support across the agricultural community. The whole farm review scheme provided financial advice and action planning to support farmers and crofters. It is now closed for applications and we will, we will be announcing a new support scheme in the near future. The Scottish Government also works with the Royal Scottish Agricultural Benevolent Institution, donating £50,000 in August 2015 to the charity to help it fund financial assistance and support to people 
who have worked in Scotland in land-based occupations and who are suffering hardship. Maurice Corey. I thank the Minister for his response. Um, and a supplementary question. Uh, the statistics released on Monday show that farm debt has risen to the highest level since records began in 1972. The NFU Scotland say increased debt has been caused by late support payments and lower market prices. Can the Minister guarantee that the CAP payments will be made on time next year? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, well, as I said yesterday, we, we have uh, announced a, a package uh, of injecting up to £300 million, uh, and the, the aim is to do that by the, in the first fortnight of November. Mm. I was very pleased that the NFU welcomed uh, this uh, measure uh, as a, <laughs> an enormous contribution to the rural economy. With regard to the issue of debt, obviously I appreciate fully that many farmers have had a difficult time uh, in respect of a number of factors, including dif difficult uh, prices across several ranges of their activity. I would also point out, however, for the sake of accuracy, since somehow it was omitted from uh, the, uh, the points made by other members on the same issue yesterday from the Conservative ranks, that whilst the level of debt has risen in Scotland by, 47, by, by a certain amount, it's actually risen by a higher amount south of the border, and therefore right across the UK, farmers have increased their debt. It's entirely wrong to say that this is somehow a, a Scottish only matter, but it is a very serious issue, and therefore we continue to work with the banks who have provided enormous help. And I'm slightly surprised that we haven't heard some sort of recognition of that support from other members, but perhaps it's just an inadvertent omission. <laughs> Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary and uh, I would thank him for his comprehensive answers, although I do have to apologise to all the members. I wasn't able to uh, call for questions. And we now move on to the next item of business. Yeah, so point of order, Murder Fraser. Thank you. Thank you, Presiding Officer. You may recall, Presiding Officer, I raised at the, um, before the summer recess a point of order about availability of printed copies of the business bulletin at the back of the chamber. And at that time, I think, in correspondence, you undertook to ensure that these would be available to members coming into the chamber. I noticed today uh, that there are no copies available at the back of the chamber. It was a similar situation last Thursday uh, when uh, at the start of First Minister's questions there were no copies available. I wonder if you could endeavour uh, to ensure, Presiding Officer, that there will be sufficient uh, copies available for members who come in who wish to consult a paper copy in future. Can I thank Murda Fraser for that point of order. Uh, I'm only surmising at this stage, I suspect there were a limited number but not enough to meet demand today. However, I think the point will be taken on board the fact that we're not enough last week and today, and I'll make sure that the parliamentary officials take note of that and try and meet your requirements and, and the whole chamber's requirements from now on. Thank you. 